gallery to do so quietly, please. And the next item of business is Members' Business Debate on Motion 10590 in the name of Alexander Stewart on RAF 100, the centenary of the Royal Air Force. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Alexander Stewart to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted and grateful of the privilege of being able to open this historic members' business debate this afternoon. And I'd pay tribute to all who have chosen to attend and support uh, in the public gallery this afternoon. 100 years ago this month, King George V authorised the creation of a new branch of British military, which was formed in response to the growing role of air power in warfare. This was created merging the aviation branches of the Royal Navy and the British Army together on the 1st of April 1918 into a single service, which was to be known thereafter as the Royal Air Force. Expanding rapidly from its inception, uh, the world's first truly independent air force, uh, the RAF, brought in a, and has sought and fought in major issues from the Second World War. Its most famous campaign being the Battle of Britain when in July to September 1940, the RAF fought off a hugely superior German air force, denying the Luftwaffe air supremacy over southern England and therefore preventing the German invasion of Britain. In May 1941, the Battle of Britain came to an end. The then Prime Minister Winston Churchill said of RAF pilots, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. By the, the end of the war in 1945, the strength of the RAF was nearly one million personnel. And at the start of the Second World War, two of the first ever Royal Auxiliary Air Force squadrons, 602 City of Glasgow squadron, and I'm delighted that we have a number of current personnel with us this afternoon in the chamber. And also uh, squadron 603, the City of Edinburgh, uh, they, they resulted in the exceptional skills that they had and the airmanship of 602 and 603 squadrons because they were instrumental in the RAF's success of, of ensuring that the Luftwaffe uh, were dealt with. And that particularly took place uh, here uh, in Scotland uh, when uh, they dealt with an aircraft over the River Forth on the 16th of October 1939. Scotland was and still is considered strategically extremely important for the defence of the United Kingdom. Indeed, the RAF constructed and operated an enormous infrastructure north of the border uh, with RAF Lossiemouth uh, in Murray and also uh, Lukers in, in Fife. And the level of RAF activity in my own region uh, of Mid-Scotland and Fife during the immediate aftermath of World War II was unprecedented and the history of the lasting legacy of this activity should forever be remembered, Deputy Presiding Officer. In 1942, the RAF regiment was formed to protect airfields from airborne troops uh, and at the wartime peak employed around 60,000 personnel. And today the, the regiment uh, continues that vital role uh, of defence uh, and also the exceptional training and the humanitarian work that they've done and continue to do and I pay tribute to them for all they've done during that time. Delighted to. Bruce Crawford. I say to Alexander Stewart, I'm sorry, Alexander, I can't stay with you on one, much longer. I've got a meeting at one o'clock, but I want to make one point. First of all, my, my son was in the RAF, and it was never a prouder moment for me than when he passed out at, at RAF Halton a number of years ago. The point of training was this issue I wanted to pick up, because I think the training he received there and the values that were instilled in that young man stood him in great stead for future employment. And that's one of the great things that the RAF still do today. I congratulate you too for bringing forward this debate today. Alexander Stewart. I would concur with that, uh, uh, Mr Crawford. As I say, there is no doubt that the exceptional quality of training that's provided does give individuals the opportunity to unlock their potential for future uh, when they're no longer even with the service. The RAF was supported in wartime by the Women's Auxiliary Air Force as well as the Princess Mary's Nursing Force. Uh, and however, the passing of the Army and Air Force Women's Service Act in 1948 created the opportunity for permanent peacetime rule for women in the armed forces in recognition of their in in incredible uh, uh, wartime contribution. And this led to the Women's Royal Air Force being formed on the 1st of February 1949 which offered women a full professional career in the Air Force for the very first time. 
And since the end of World War II, the RAF has been involved in many operations which have been vital for the survival, the stability and the peace of many nations uh, and peoples throughout the world. From the Berlin airlift uh, in 48-49 through to the huge issues within the Cold War uh, and then supporting the Royal Ulster Constabulary in Northern Ireland from 69 to 2007. Assistance in Belize, Malaysia, conflicts with reference to humanitarian work in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, operations and logistics that took place in the Falklands, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Libya, uh, and relief flights in Kenya, military intervention in Sierra Leone, Accra, Iraq, and Afghanistan. They are endless, Deputy Presiding Officer, but also the evacuation issues that they've dealt with when dealing with Beirut humanitarian and also uh, the earthquakes in Pakistan. So as I said before, uh, they, they do so much and Deputy President Miles, it is notable that the, the history and the host historic part of this centenary is to be marked and known as RAF 100 in a programme which will salute the century of RAF forces throughout a wide range of local, uh, regional and national events uh, that will take place across air shows running from April to September. And indeed, to mark our, this commemoration here, our, our own presiding officer hosted a fantastic reception in the Parliament recently, uh, and we had Air Chief Marshal Sir Stephen Hillier as the main guest. RAF 100 is also being celebrated in many parts of the country, in many regions of Scotland. Uh, and the Anchor Soma Association is to, uh, on the Saturday, the 26th of May, host the RAF Baton Relay, uh, uh, where they will uh, ensure that the Spitfire Memorial on the former site of RAF Grangemouth will be a fly past and ban take place. And the RAF will be holding a fully manned RAF display uh, on the a historical situation and have uh, aircraft at the Science Centre in Glasgow and give people the opportunity once again to view, see and pick, take part. And my own contribution is the honour, Deputy Presiding Officer, to secure this member's debate today and welcome, as I said, personnel who are here today. And I look forward to the contributions from other MSP colleagues here uh, this afternoon who will speak in support of this fantastic, highly professional and tireless work that the RAF have continued to do. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, the hallmark of this great anniversary will be a Royal Air Force Centenary Parade in London on the 10th of July. I personally congratulate Royal Air Force on reaching this 100 milestone and operations that they have been involved in. And, and will say to everyone in the past uh, and present and future individuals who have endeavoured to ensure that this, this contribution has maintained and gone forward. And I wish the Royal Air Force all the best for at least another 100 years. Thank you, <laughs> Deputy Presiding Officer. We move to the open debate, and may I have speeches of around four minutes, please? Tavish Scott, followed by Richard Lockhead. Thank you, President. Also, can I firstly thank uh, Alexander Stewart for initiating this debate and indeed share the sentiments of his remarks uh, about the role the RAF have played in the past and indeed will play undoubtedly in the future uh, as, as well. Um, could I also apologise to uh, Mr Stewart and indeed to the Chamber for having to uh, lead this debate. By one of the ironies of life, I have a meeting with one, with one of Mr Brown's colleagues uh, about RAF Saxford or what used to be RAF Saxford uh, in Amst. It's just one of those things that uh, uh, occasionally happens. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple of reflections about the role the RAF played in Shetland over the uh, war period and since then. Uh, but I suppose the first thing I should say is that one of the more arduous duties that uh, uh, local members uh, may have played uh, is uh, taking on the speaking responsibilities at the annual RAFA dinner uh, for the Battle of Britain. Uh, and I was told and advised on this um, uh, prior to the first time I was asked to do this uh, in Lerwick that um, it was an occasion when um, uh, those who had put so much into uh, the, the role of uh, uh, the role that their air force had played uh, in the defence of our country um, let their hair down to some extent and it wouldn't automatically follow that by the time I was asked to speak they'd be completely in control of their faculties uh, which was a great relief to me never mind to, to them in getting through that occasion but uh, the point of the of the Rafa club which still does exist in, in Lerwick is that it's a calling uh, it's a place of calling for uh, many um, more uh, younger uh, members of the veterans community from the RAF who still uh, meet to uh, discuss old times uh, and to 
remember uh, those who are no longer uh, with them. Uh, Sulinvo in Shetland was, was the Coastal Command Squadron airfield uh, for uh, the flying boats in the Second World War. Uh, indeed, I, I found out the other day that on the 4th of November 1939, Sulinvo became the first location in the British Isles to be uh, bombed. Uh, no damage was formally reported, apart, and it is, uh, go, apart I'm told, uh, from the death of a rabbit. Um, that wasn't a great loss, uh, I can assure you. Um, the complex was added to when uh, a nearby airfield was, was uh, completed, RAF uh, Skatsta, which to this day, of course, uh, continues to fly uh, helicopter transfers uh, to the west and east of Shetland for, for the oil industry. And, of course, Sulevo is actually n uh, today known, of course, as the... Um, uh, for the uh, for the all terminal rather than for uh, anything else. Two notable events amongst uh, great acts of heroism and bravery during the Second World War. The first was uh, flying officer John Cruikshank, who was awarded the Victoria Cross for a uh, successful attack on German U-boats uh, during the war, despite um, being injured uh, as he attacked uh, and managing to bring his aircraft home and indeed circling till daylight in order to land uh, and save his crew uh, successfully. And the second one is um, the... Uh, crash uh, of the RAF Cantalina uh, in the island of Yale to the north of Sulinvo uh, when she came back after searching for the searching the Norwegian coast for the Tirpitz. Um, ice built up on the wings, uh, the weather was pretty awful and the, and the, uh, and the aircraft crashed. Uh, mercifully all three of the crew uh, survived and the, uh, the uh, state they were in it's some remarkable achievement that they did survive given they actually uh, landed in the middle uh, of Yale uh, many miles from uh, any uh, house uh, or uh, residence. Uh, the only other point I wanted to make is that this goes on. The, uh, when I was first elected, we still had the Cold War, and RAF uh, Saxford in Ernst was the radar dome that kept an eye on the Russians. Uh, uh, it's coming back. Uh, Sir Stephen Hillier, uh, that uh, Alexander Stewart rightly mentioned, came up to Shetland in um, January uh, to uh, view the £10 million radar dome, which links to both Lossiemouth and to Collingsby in Lincolnshire, uh, and provides both NATO and the RAF with um, forward warning of the uh, Russian, and it will be Russian, uh, aircraft that are flying uh, close to uh, uh, airspace that uh, is, in this sense, uh, part of the UK's responsibilities uh, under NATO. It is uh, a source of concern, I suppose, to me and to many others that I thought we had gone from the Cold War period. I didn't think that would ever come back uh, when I was first elected. And here we are now today in circumstances where we're putting back radar and defence to cope with a threat which in the modern world I simply thought had disappeared. But for that and for the role the RAF played, I share Alexander Stewart's sentiments indeed about their continuing role in the world we live in. Paul Richard Lockhead to be followed by Liz Smith. Can I congratulate Alexander Stewart on his speech and for giving Parliament the opportunity to commemorate and celebrate the RAF's centenary and of course also commemorate the service given by thousands and tens of thousands of men and women over the past hundred years to defend their country and participate in many other valuable tasks and of course many of whom made the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, can I also say that this is an opportunity to celebrate the RF's role in Scotland uh, and, of course, my own perspective in my own constituency of Murray uh, as well. And I should say that I enjoyed the BBC programme RAF 100, which, of course, was hosted by my constituent, Colin McGregor, a former tornado pilot uh, at the RAF Lossiemouth, who continues to, of course, live in, and work in the local community. Uh, and as some may, people may say in Elgin, his lesser known brother, uh, Ewan McGregor, uh, as well. Uh, but it was good that the two Scots were hosting that programme because Scotland has had a big influence on the Royal Air Force and we should not forget that it's David Henderson, a Scot, who was said to have written the report in 1917 that went to the UK government making the proposal for the Royal Air Force, which then came into form, it was, which was formed in 1918, but that went in the name, of course, of General Christian Smuts. So a Scot, of course, is credited with writing that report and we should remember that. And today, we have a Scot and a former Gilmarnock Academy pupil, Sir Stephen Hillier, who, of course, is currently the Air Chief Marshal and Chief of the Air Staff. The RAF, of course, has fulfilled many important duties defending our country and promoting humanitarian effort around the world over the past uh, 100 years. Some, of course, may be con controversial due to decisions taken by the political masters, but the service of the men and women has always been characterised by dedication and professionalism, and that can never be questioned. And, of course, many of the tasks have been vital, like the Berlin airlift in 1948 and 1949. But, of course, by 1939, uh, no victory on land or sea 
could be achieved without superiority uh, in our skies. And of course, the Battle of Britain in 1940 is in many people's minds what defines the, the achievements of the RAF and perhaps the service's high point. And of course, the D-Day landings would not have been successful in 1944 without having superiority of air cover uh, as well. But in Murray, uh, throughout the generations over the past 50 years and between 50 and 100 years, people, of course, have been used to seeing the, the Buccaneers, the Shackletons, the Jaguars, the Tornadoes, the Typhoons, the Nimrods, uh, and so on, in the skies above our local communities. And many of those planes, of course, were part of the Navy, but the one constant feature over that time has been the presence of the RAF uh, in Murray. And today, you can still see the abandoned airfields and all the, the buildings and so on and so forth, at places like Dalachy and Milltown that played important roles uh, in the last war. And, of course, today we still have RAF Lossiemouth. We also had RAF Loss, which, of course, closed in 2012 as an RAF base. But today, RAF Lossiemouth continues to thrive as Scotland's only operational air base. And it also played an important role in the Second World War in various ways, but perhaps most famously, the 29 Lancasters that took off from there in November 1944, uh, comprising squad squadrons 617 and 9, uh, sunk the turpits in Norwegian waters. <clears throat> as I said, RAF can law sadly closed in 2012 after 73 years as an RAF base, uh, but RAF Lossiemouth today is continuing to expand. And even today, as we've been speaking, uh, the, uh, the closure of the ceremony has been taking place at RAF Lossiemouth over the cutting of the turf for the new nine P-8A Poseidon maritime patrol aircraft that are going to be based there to join the Typhoons who've moved in to take over from the Tornadoes and we're also getting a new squadron soon of the Typhoons as well. So RAF Lossiemouth is continuing to play an even greater role in the defence of the country. And that brings other benefits as well like Boeing, for instance, are going to be building at RAF Lossiemouth and creating new high-skilled jobs there. So I'm hoping there'll be spillover for the local economy from that centre of excellence that will be developed over time. So in closing, I just want to say that the RAF has helped define many of Murray's communities. The former personnel, of which there are literally thousands, and the current personnel, of which there are also thousands, play a vital role in the local community. They're part of the local community. They contribute to the local community. And I hope that positive relationship continues in the future. And I join other members in wishing the RAF a very happy and prosperous 100th birthday. Liz Smith, followed by David Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank my colleague, uh, Alexander Stewart, for bringing this debate to Parliament on what is undoubtedly a very historic occasion. Deputy Presiding Officer, in the War Museum in Valletta, one of the biggest visitor attractions is a Gloucester Gladiator biplane known as Faith. It's the sole survivor of the trio of biplanes Faith, Hope and Charity, whose pilots virtually single-handedly against all the odds night after night, hour after hour, defended the tiny island of Malta in some of the darkest days of the Second World War between 1940 and 42. For me, it is an airplane which symbolizes not just the ordeal of the RAF servicemen and the people of Malta who stood courageously against the Axis nations, especially when all looked lost, but also the skill, determination and indomitable spirit which has been the hallmark of the RAF for the whole century of its existence. Indeed, I don't think there is anything that better exemplifies the distinctive character of the RAF, which prides itself on ensuring that all its personnel pull together as a team in order to deliver effective air power no matter the challenges or the environment in which the squadrons may find themselves. At the recent centenary event in Holyrood, which many of us had the great privilege to attend, it was very clear that the abiding strength of the RAF, whether they are to be found in the most senior officer or in the most junior cadet, are the strength of its leadership, the expectation and the delivery of the highest professional and personal standards, and the strong strength of tradition. We all owe so much to the RAF, whether that was in the darkest hour of the Second World War or as it combines today with the other armed services to defend this nation in an increasingly fragile world and to strengthen international peace and its stability. When seeking new recruits, the RAF says that it wants men and women whose personal qualities of integrity and respect reflect the core values of the RAF. They want men and women who will respond to a demanding way of life who aspire to excellence, who share a sense of duty and commitment, and who recognize that the life of another person may depend on them, as might their life depend 
on themselves. My own interest in the RAF is as a result of my father's World War II service in Malta and laterally in Sicily. He was a corporal in one of the squadrons which faced the ultimate challenge of standing four square against the siege of Malta between 1940 and 42, including many months with little food or any other comfort, which battled against all the odds to hold off the relentless bombing of Italy's Regia Aeronautica and then Germany's Luftwaffe. No fewer than 3,000 raids took place on Malta's towns and ports in the course of two years, with 15,000 tonnes of bombs being dropped. It was extraordinary what the RAF and indeed the people of Malta achieved as the unsinkable aircraft carrier, the term that Winston Churchill used to describe the island. Fighting alone against the Italian Air Force between June and October 1940, just as their colleagues were about to do battle of Britain, the six volunteers who flew the gladiator biplanes, Faith, Hope and Charity, were the epitome of the RAF and all that it has meant to this country. As members know, the combined determination of Churchill and the chiefs of the air defence staff in the face of pressure from France to sell out on Malta was the reason that the Allies were sub subsequently able to defeat the Axis in the Mediterranean, that the Second Battle of El Alamein in November 1942 was successful, which in turn allowed Allied alert landings in Morocco and Algeria in Operation Torch. Little wonder then that the RAF was held in such high precious regard. In the modern era, RAF officers and their families would be the first to admit that so much is owed by the support of charities. The RAF Association, the RAF Benevolent Fund, the RAF Charitable Trust and the RAF Museum. And I was personally delighted to learn that thanks to the assistance of these charities in order to mark the centenary, the 14 war memorial, memorials dedicated to airmen from the First and Second World Wars will now have heritage protection, including those which commemorate the most decorated World War I pilot and the first pilot to shoot down a German Zeppelin. I was also delighted to learn that in the centenary year, the RAF is supporting a new programme designed to encourage far more young people into STEM subjects in Scotland, something which we know from the evidence in schools, colleges and universities is so desperately needed and that in a very short time scale, I hope that that will happen. Deputy Presiding Officer, the journey from the merger of the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal National Air Service on the 1st of April 1918, when each had just around 100 aircraft, balloons and airships, to the high-tech service that the RAF is today is quite remarkable. In the excellent documentary recently presented by Ewan and Colin McGregor, whose parents live in Perthshire, just a few miles away from me, the 100 years of technical change has been shown in its fullest measure. But so too was the dedication, the professionalism, and the heroism of RAF veterans who were interviewed. We all owe them so very much. That biplane faith, which stands alone, but proudly, in Valletta's War Museum, will for me remain the enduring symbol of the RAF. It is their courage, their will to win, and their spirit now being passed down through the generations that is the mainstay of the RAF, and indeed this country, we must celebrate this centenary. Thank you. Call David Stewart to be followed by Maurice Corey. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I want to congratulate Alexander Stewart for securing this afternoon's debate and for his comprehensive and very thoughtful speech. The message, President Officer, that will resound across the Chamber today is that we all owe a debt of gratitude and honour to the RAF and the role that they play in the defence of our nation. And I would echo Poppy Scotland's words when they say, we thank all those who have served, are still serving, and their families for their service and sacrifice. President Officer, a little more than eight short years ago, I brought to this chamber a members debate to discuss concerns about the possible closure of RAF King Loss. The cross-party campaign was supported by all the party leaders at the time. Alex Salmond, Annabel Goldie, Tavish Scott and Ian Gray. I argued then, and I argue today, that armed forces personnel have a social covenant with our country at times of peace and at times of war. And during times of conflict, I always remember the lines from John Maxwell Emmons that are repeated every Remembrance Sunday across Scotland and beyond. When you go home, tell them of us and say, for their tomorrow we gave our today. The importance of the social covenant was best illustrated to me 26 years ago when the American naval base at Danoon closed with the loss of 1,500 American personnel. 
the local community rallied round and set up a dynamic economic committee that received European and government funding support to diversify the economy and provide new jobs. Like most members in the chamber today, my interest in this debate is personal. My father did his national service with the RAF at King Loss as a fresh-faced 18-year-old uh, over 70 years ago. And during my last year of school in the Highlands, uh, I thought seriously about joining the RAF, but instead I chose the less hazardous, hazardous conflict zone that comes with a career in politics. However, during my time in Westminster from 1997, I relished the opportunity to serve for the RAF for two terms as part of the Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme. And I want to put in record, President Officer, my thanks to my friend Sir Neil Thorne for his initiative in setting up the scheme in Westminster. And of course, welcome, up the, welcome the scheme that we have in the Scottish Parliament. And I hope that members from all sides of the Chamber will volunteer to take part in it. Due to my involvement with the Westminster programme, I had direct experience of RAF King Loss and Lossy Mouth, as well as a memorable week in Basra in Iraq, uh, which is still etched in my memory. As part of the scheme, I flew in a Tornado fast jet, a Nimrod maritime aircraft, and a Sea King search and rescue helicopter. On my last day with the RAF, the Sea King I was involved in had to attend an emergency in Glencoe, and I vividly remember flying a few hundred feet above Loch Ness on the way to Glencoe, and observed at first hand the bravery, expertise, and professionalism and the pilots and the winch crew as they saved the life of a young Swiss mountaineer who had fallen and suffered severe facial injuries. My experience was a brief snapshot, but it gave me tremendous admiration for the armed forces and for veterans. We should always remember that people do not stay in the armed forces forever, and our responsibility to people who have served our country doesn't stop when they leave the service. The covenant that we make with those in service community does not stop when they rejoin civilian life. It's also important that we bear in mind as a country we've invested a great deal of money in training our service men and women, and that, although we've a duty to ensure they're looked after, we have a duty to ensure that the investment in skills and training is not lost to society. That's just one reason why it's so important we ensure a high quality transition from the services to civilian life. I warmly welcome this debate to mark and salute the centenary of the RAF. The RAF 100 will have a wide ranging group of community, regional and national events. Let us all unite today in congratulating the RAF and praise the personnel of the past, the present and the future. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from Maurice Corey. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted today to speak in the the today's debate to mark the 100th anniversary of the Armed Forces' youngest and most prestigious military branch. I'm reminded of the comment of the RAF representative at the recent Armed Forces and Veterans Community Cross Party Group this week, who said that although they are the youngest service branch, they are the best looking. Well, being a former British Army officer, I couldn't possibly agree with such a comment, but nevertheless, I admire their spirit and determination. Nevertheless, I thank the RAF for the many times that I've flown with them, and particularly to and from operational areas and within it, uh, with the RAF Support Command over the years. And today, I'd like to thank my colleague, Alexander Stewart, for bringing forward this member's debate in such an auspicious occasion. It is right that we take a moment to pay our respect to the esteemed organization of our RAF, of our Royal Air Force, and those who have and have the privilege of serving in the ranks. Despite being the youngest service, it does have a proud and a very Scottish record. It is demonstrated from the earliest days of the RAF in having Britain's first operational air station near Montrose and during the Battle of Britain as the RAF stood as a final line of defence against the Nazi invasion led by the Scotsman Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding and in more recent times the RAF response to the Russian threats against our airspace which has been based out of Scotland and the RAF Lossiemouth. I want to speak a bit more about the modern RAF in Scotland. Of course, its main operating base in Lossiemouth and Murray, and it is growing with the additional support of the squadron of Typhoon fighters on, its way, on the way alongside uh, the new P-8 Alpha Poseidon aircraft, which are also to be based there. All great news for that part of the country, as it means more investment and jobs in the local community, to which Richard, uh, Leonard, uh, Richard sorry, Lockhead so rightly referred. I am sure that this will be, uh, include the new STEM program as well, which my colleague Liz Smith referred to earlier on in this debate. Lossy is a central part of the defence arrangements for the UK and it is home to the Quick Reaction Alert units, whose job is to defend our airspace from incursion, in particular from the Russians. 
It also plays a part in our responsibility to our NATO allies by being part of the Baltic air policing effort, again deterring operations from the Russian state. Alongside a host of our activities and work, such as providing planes and men for the operations in the Falkland Islands, Operation Shader in the Middle East, as host for ex Exercise Joint Warrior, and also hosting a mountain rescue team in Scotland. <clears throat> also, uh, so there is a lot of happening in just that one location, but Lossie Mouse isn't the only RAF presence in Scotland. It stretches right across the nation. Scotland is home to four of the RAF Reserve squadrons, namely the 602 City of Glasgow Squadron, 603 City of Edinburgh Squadron, 612 County of Aberdeen Squadron, and 2622 Highland Squadron. They provide a number of vital areas of the RAF emission support, force protection, police, and the RAF regiment and medical support. Of course, as the military comes to rely more and more on a reservist, the importance of these units to the RAF can never be underestimated. Scotland is also the home of number six flying training school, which gives flight training to both the RAF University's air squadrons and the air experience flight, which both give young people the opportunity to learn to fly and give them an insight look into what a career in the RAF could entail. And Deputy Presiding Officer, finally, the RAF is also reopening the radar head at Saxevoort, which my colleague Tavish Scott referred to in uh, the Shetland Islands, which is a welcome investment of 10 million pounds and will keep our country really safe. And having experience of having served up there some years ago in Inside Right, I know fully well what the, the job it has to carry out, which is extremely important in protecting NATO and our force from the Shetland Islands through, right through to Turkey. So, Deputy Designing Officer, as you can see, the RAF history with the Scotland is very deep and meaningful, and the RAF has a very real commitment in Scotland today, and I'm sure that its future will be well connected very strongly as our country today and as well in the future and the next 100 years. Thank you. And now I call Keith Brown to respond to the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you also to Alexander Stewart for tabling this debate. Um, and I'm delighted that it's actually been a very supportive uh, and interesting debate in the Chamber, which continues to recognise the work of all of our armed forces, but in this case, particularly, of course, the RAF, both past and present. And we are celebrating, of course, the formation of the RAF on the 1st of April 1918, the first independent Air Force in the world. And also born out of necessity 100 years ago, the Royal Air Force today continues to lead the way, as we've heard, whether that be in combating modern threats to our security or delivering humanitarian aid around the world. And a century ago, of course, we were in the midst of a terrible conflict, the likes of which is quite difficult to understand and envisage today. Uh, towards the end of the First World War, the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Navy Air Service were merged to form the Royal Air Force. And during the Second World War, the RAF expanded, as you'd expect, very quickly with aerial defence provided, amongst other things, by the elegant and instantly recognisable aircraft, the Hawker Hurricane, and also the Supermarine Spitfire, including, of course, during the Battle of Britain, which has been mentioned by a number of members. Uh, and today, the RAF continues to defend our security and airspace through the quick reaction alert capability, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, from RAF uh, Lossiemouth and RAF Coningsby. As well as being the home, though, to the Quick Reaction Alert North, uh, RAF Lossiemouth in Murray is also home to three squadrons of typhoons, and I'm sure the local communities are looking forward to welcoming more RAF personnel and families with the arrival of a further typhoon squadron and, as has been mentioned by Maurice Corey, the Poseidon Maritime Patrol aircraft. The RAF family in Scotland, of course, extends well beyond the communities in Murray with a presence maintained at Lucas and Fife and two Royal Auxiliary Air Force squadrons based in the Central Belt, all of whom have a warm relationship and close ties to their local communities. Now, during that 100 years, as you would expect, the RAF has changed a great deal. The Women's Royal Air Force was created on the 1st of April 1918 at the same time as the RAF, following the formation of the Women's Auxiliary Army Service and the Women's Royal Naval Service in 1917. And the First World War also saw the formation of separate women's services for the first time. And women, of course, played an integral role uh, during the First World War. And although the three services were subsequently disbanded, they were quickly reformed for the Second World War. In the 1990s, the separate women's services were subsumed into the main services. I mean, I see women work alongside their male counterparts in many varied roles. Uh, the RAF has now opened all roles to women, the first of the three services to do so. Uh, the Royal Navy, of course, has had women serving at sea since 1990, and the Army has lifted the ban on women serving in close combat roles. Many of the contributions today have drawn on the personal experience of individual members. 
and at the risk of boring some of those who attended the uh, event that we had with the RAF um, hosted by the presiding officer a couple of weeks ago, I'll just recount briefly my experience. I think I've had three times I've, I've been obliged to hitch a lift with the RAF and the first of those was uh, returning uh, actually from the Falkland Islands conflict in 1982 when we got a lift back from Ascension Island uh, to uh, RAF Lukers. And I do remember as a shy, modest, retiring Marine, uh, not wanting to mention the fact that the chairs, the chairs were all facing the wrong way on the aircraft, but um, there was very good reason for that, for health and safety reasons. Uh, the second time was actually on a trip to uh, Norway, again from RAF Lukers. And what struck me at the time, perhaps it's unremarkable for the RAF, was their ability to land the Hercules aircraft on a completely snowbound airport. The skill that that involved was remarkable. And the last and perhaps most memorable time was to have a, a, a chance to go into a tornado, uh, as, as Dave Stewart had done, which uh, followed on from the RAF coming to the Parliament here, having an open day and winning a ballot to be the person, the MSP, that got to go uh, up in the tornado. To my extreme disappointment, I passed the medical with flying colours, which meant that the pilot could do whatever he wanted, uh, while having to observe the 200 metre floor, but everything else was open. And uh, usually the next question that follows is followed by the answer three times, and I'll not go into that anymore. But what did strike me, and I did say this uh, at the event, was the just the modest, understated manner and very evident uh, competence of the pilot, the professionalism of that pilot uh, that day, the way that he did various things in there, uh, you know, without really thinking about it uh, to, to any great extent, such was the level of training and practice that had been experienced both over the North Sea and on mainland Scotland. So very impressive, the personnel that had been produced uh, by uh, the RAF. And building on the success that we've seen, uh, we have now Eric Fraser in the role as Veterans Commissioner here in Scotland. A number of members have mentioned, in particular uh, Dave Stewart, the need to capitalise on the skills, the investment that the country makes in the skills and the competencies of our service personnel, and in particular the RAF. And going back to the points made by uh, Richard Lockhead, I was struck by two uh, RAF personnel who left uh, the RAF but stayed in Lossiemouth, developed a product which was then able to go into the American defence market and have created a business there. And Morris Corey and I have talked about this on, on a number of occasions. We really have to do much more of that to keep that huge level of concentration of skills, uh, keep it in the local area for the benefit of the local uh, area. Uh, the RAF, along with the other services, provides, of course, career opportunities for engineers, air crew, medics, and many other professions. Uh, service personnel gain a variety of transferable skills during their military careers, and often some of our job, and I know this is true for Maurice Corey as well, is trying to tell some service personnel how experienced, how capable, and how useful the skills are that they have gained, how relevant they are to uh, uh, Civvy Street. Uh, and many of those skills are in very high demand in commercial organisations throughout Scotland, perhaps even more so for RAF personnel uh, than other personnel. And I'm keen for our part that the Scottish... Yes, I will do, yeah. Michelle Ballantyne. Well, whilst, whilst you're on the subject of, of skills gained, would you join me in actually congratulating the RAF on the work it does with young people? We actually have the biggest air cadet organisation in the world, um, and I was fortunate to serve as a flight lieutenant as a squadron commander with the Air Training Corps, and I have to say the RAF do a superb job in supporting young people, and in this year of the young people, I think it's particularly fitting that we celebrate RAF 100 and the year of the young people that same time. Keith Brown. I, I would certainly agree and point out I'm wearing the Year of the Young People badge today, but I could also say that my twin nieces both uh, served with the uh, Air, Air uh, Cadets, not with any intention of actually going on for a military career, but they got a fantastic amount of the experience that they had, so I would certainly uh, join in the commendation of what the Cadet Service does. Uh, for my part, I'm very keen the Scottish Government continues to focus to help people leaving the armed forces put those valuable skills into practice and to succeed in their chosen career. It's been mentioned already, I think, by Alexander Stewart that on the 10th of July the, uh, in London, the RF will be on show for a centenary parade and fly past. And I'm sure there'll be an excellent celebration and a fitting testament to all serving personnel taking part and to the many RAF veterans who will turn out in support. And many events also are planned for Scotland, including the Scottish National Air Show, an RAF Families Garden Party, and many STEM events, science, technology, engineering, and maths for young Scots to encourage the take up of these subjects in their schools. So for my part, I'm very pleased to have been provided with the opportunity to pay tribute to the men and women of the Royal Air Force in this centenary year. It will be for them a busy and exciting time with many events, both official and unofficial, and I would imagine most fun is to be had at those unofficial events, some of which Tavish Scott referred to, uh, and they will stoke up many memories for the years to come. So I would 
encourage all those who are able to do so to become involved in these events and to enjoy the well-deserved spotlight on the RAF. And I hope that the Chamber will join me in congratulating the RAF on reaching its centenary and to wish it, as Alexander Stewart has done, continued success for the next 100 years. Thank you. That concludes the debate and the meeting is suspended until half past two.